Hi, I'm Mike. Welcome to Ignite History. Today we're going to be talking about Ivan the Terrible and answering the question, was he actually that terrible? Many European monarchs are remembered as the Great. Alexander the Great, Constantine the Great, Frederick the Great, Peter the Great, the list goes on and on and on. So why would a monarch be called terrible? Well, one must understand that the original Russian word, Grozny, actually meant something closer to fearsome or terrifying. So it's actually kind of intended as a compliment more than anything. But the question still stands, was Ivan IV really that terrible? And the answer is, f yes. Ivan IV and his deaf brother Yuri were orphaned from a very young age. His father dying from an infection in the leg from a hunting accident, and his mother very likely poisoned. Ivan and his brother grew under the shadow of what's called the boyars. These are the warlord nobility. Ivan was always sickly, so the noble families neglected him and his deaf brother. So in proper soap opera fashion, he developed a distrust, quickly turning into a hatred for the nobility. This would follow him for the rest of his life. According to some of the childhood stories, he plucked bird feathers and threw cats and dogs out of windows in frustration. Will uh, someone call animal services, please? Ivan was the son of Vasily III, the Grand Prince of Moscow. And when he reached the age of 16, he was crowned the Tsar of all Russia, the first official Tsar. And believe you me, no one's calling animal services on the Tsar. The word Tsar, coming from the Roman word Caesar, almost implying he had a godlike rule. From an early age, Ivan was an ambitious and able ruler. He established the Zemsky Sobor in 1549, which is an assembly of representatives from three states the nobility, the clergy, and the commoners. This body deliberated over the Sudebnik, uh, otherwise known as their law code. He established a Russian standing army, the Stretsky. He also introduced the first printing press in Russia. Following that, he commissioned the build for St. Basil's Cathedral, otherwise known as those big colorful cones in Moscow. There is a story that Ivan blinded the cathedral architect, just so that he could never make anything so divine ever again. Although, this is likely a fabricated story after his death. Well, so, things were going fine, and Ivan started expansion into Siberia, as well as Livonia, a Catholic nation to the northwest that would give Muscovy access to the Baltic Sea and its promise of maritime trade. This was until, in 1553, he was taken with a severe illness. He asked the boyars, the ruling elite, to swear allegiance to him and his son. Many refused and decided they'd put one of their own on, Vladimir Andreevich, on the throne. And the dying, tortured, pitiful protagonist of this story took that to heart, and unfortunately for the boyars, he recovered. He sent Vladimir to Moscow and made him regent to his son in case he died. He also had many top officials assassinated, including Saint Philip II of Moscow and Prince Alexander Gorbachev of the powerful Shusky family. That strike one. Then, in 1560, his beloved wife, Anastasia, dies. This is probably the only person that Ivan ever loved in his life. Well, I mean, as much as any monster like Ivan could love anybody. And he believed that she was poisoned by the boyars. This has been later confirmed by modern analysis of her bones containing a stupidly high amount of mercury. So he was actually probably right about this one. That was strike two. And then, in 1564, during the Livonian War in the Northwest, his close friend and advisor, Andrei Kerbsky, defected to the Lithuanians. This is strike three. This betrayal was the final straw for our paranoid Ivan and he decided to abdicate and left Moscow for the town of Alexandrovskaya Sloboda. Anyway, this, this place. After being in isolation for a while, the boyar sent a delegation calling for him to return. He replied and said that the realm was full of traitors and he would only return on two conditions. If he was given executive authority to execute traitors and steal their land for his own, and that everybody watching this video subscribe to the channel. The nobles needed him back. They had a lot going on. There was the Livonian War still ongoing in the northwest, and Tatars raiding their territory from the south. So unfortunately, everyone agreed to his ridiculous and frankly crazy demands. Abdicating a throne to get more powers has to be the most giga chad move ever. Russia, at this time in 1560, was a very uncertain place. You had to deal with the Tatars, the Lithuanians, the Polish, and other regional powers. Then there was famine, discontent among the population, and whispers of rebellion. The region itself was then split into two administrative halves. 
the Boyer Council governed the southern half, Zemschichna, with its capital, Moscow. When the Tsar returned, he had complete control of Oprichnina, the northern section of the newly conquered area, with Novgorod as its capital. He established a group of enforcers called the Oprichniki, who owed absolute allegiance to Ivan, and almost had like a monopoly on rape, torture, and murder. They were kind of like a OG KGB, if you will. So they took care of administrative work and political adversaries. The Oprichniki were guided by an absolutist ideology. The word of Ivan the Terrible. They were forced to ascend services at dawn where the Tsar called himself the Hand of God. It was almost like a religious order. They wore black garbs and tied severed dogs' heads to their saddles. The idea was that the dogs would sniff out traitors. A hint of their presence sent people packing and who could blame them? The Oprichniki were brutal torturers. They never held back and tortured people publicly, tearing people limb from limb using horses, boiling, impaling, and even roasting people over an open fire. Women and children were not exempt. Yikes. In 1564, Ivan became suspicious of Vladimir Andreevich, who had declared the regent to his son. The Oprichniki burnt down his palace and confiscated his estates, one of the powers that the boyars allowed him when he returned from his exile. Once he was sufficiently stripped of his land and titles, he simply was murdered along with the rest of his family. During another one of Ivan's neurotic, paranoid episodes in 1568, he had around 150 boyars in Moscow killed and tortured over conspiracies, real or imaginary. To give you a taste of how absolutely sick this man was, he once got a boyar that he wasn't particularly fond of and had him impaled from the bottom until it came out his neck. Ivan then brought the boyar's mother into the room while the impaled man was still alive and then had her, and I quote, defiled until she died in front of him by the Oprichniki. I'm sure he didn't want to stick around for that one. Get it? Because he was on a stick. Sorry. Sorry about that. All of Muscovy, understandably, were starting to get a little bit sick of his murdering sprees, which in turn made Ivan even more suspicious of the population. He already squashed a rebellion in Izborsk, whose people colluded with the Poles, now, the Tsar saw treason and conspiracies everywhere, including Novgorod. He thought that the elites of Novgorod, including the Orthodox Church, were in bed with the Polish king, and feared that he would soon have another open rebellion on his hands. So what do you do when you want to keep the population quiet? Murder, baby. Novgorod had been an independent city-state before Ivan's comeback, and held supporters of Vladimir, who Ivan had murdered a few years prior. So he ordered the Oprichniki to march on the city. Now bear in mind the city of Novgorod, due to its proximity to Livonia, was paying a disproportionate amount of taxes and manpower to sustain the war going on there. So just imagine living there and watching your own army storm in, pillaging the countryside, raping and looting and destroying everything in their wake. They burned fields, looted, massacred, raped. I mean, these guys built walls with spikes around the city to stop people leaving. So, after the Oprichniki had a little bit of fun for a few days, in the opening days of 1570, Ivan himself reached the city. Ivan summoned the high clergy, by which I mean they manhandled them and subsequently beat half of them to death. Their corpses were sent around the monasteries for burial. The archbishop was paraded around town and thrown in prison, while Ivan continued to ransack the city. Ivan and his Oprichniki continued to pillage, massacre and rape the city's population for five whole weeks. Merchants, monks, citizens, women, children, no one was safe. There are reports from foreign mercenaries that Ivan even had a custom skillet that he brought with him, solely for the purpose of frying people alive. Yikes. Peasants were chased out of town where they froze to death. People caught escaping were taken to the nearby icy river and drowned. Ivan then returned to Moscow via Piskov and continued to probe the conspiracy. Anyone in contact with the archbishop was hanged and the Archbishop died under uncertain circumstances. Estimates of casualties from this ordeal vary. Some think 2,500, others believe 27,000. Novgorod, once a great city, now in ruins. Almost 90% of their farmable land was razed. Disease started to set in, and Novgorod's decline brought about a food shortage and tax shortage that later led to Russia's unsuccessful campaign in the Livonian War. The Crimean Tatars, left over of the Mongol Empire, took advantage of the political turmoil and launched raids back into Russia. In 1571 they set a massive fire to Moscow, and I mean, burnt it to the ground. And the Oprichniki basically let them do it. 
there was around 60,000 to 200,000 casualties, and the city was completely destroyed. The Russian army defeated the Tatars in 1572, but Ivan himself didn't return to Moscow for several years, given this, you know, it was burned to the ground. He disbanded the opportunity after blaming them for the sack of Moscow, just like he blamed his daughter-in-law for dressing immodestly and beat her so severely that she had a miscarriage. His son, obviously, you know, a little annoyed over the incident, confronts him. So, how do you think that went? You might have seen this painting by Ilya Repin. It's called Ivan the Terrible and his son Ivan. Oh, he did. Ivan was not a happy man, to say the least. He had at least six to eight wives during his life that we know of, probably more. One, he had drowned the day after they were married because he found out that she was not a virgin on the wedding night. When Polish forces were making headway against Russia in the late 1570s, he reached out to Queen Elizabeth, offering an alliance and even proposing marriage. Eh, she left him on scene. So, he signed a treaty and ceded territory to Poland in 1583. He dies a year later, possibly having a stroke, but fairly likely he was poisoned. But either way, he died a bitter, paranoid old man. So, so let's answer the question. Was Ivan the Terrible really that terrible? I mean, he wasn't too much different from the average European monarch at the time. Uh, maybe just a little bit more rapey and pillagey. Most monarchs at this time were power hungry, but few in history have the creative spirit Ivan the Terrible had when it came to inflicting the most suffering on the people that crossed him. So he centralized power for himself, terrorized a large portion of the population with his murderous monks, and even killed his own son. So I'd say, yeah. So thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you want to hear more of terrible pronunciation and bad history. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you.